Hello and welcome to this presentation which is called Playing at the Edge of Chaos. This is the name of a session I gave at Counterplay Festival uh, 2019. My name's Kevin Davidson. I work at Goldsmiths College in London in the Department of Education. When I gave this session back in April, um, my plan was to play some games and then go through some theory. But in the end, we were having such fun that we didn't get onto the theory. So I thought I would do a little, uh, little review of the session and I'll go through the theory first and then secondly link it to some of the activities we did in our session together. So I'd like to begin with complexity theory and complexity theory in the context of education. And I came across this uh, in this book, Engaging Minds when I was writing my master's dissertation. Um, these people reviewed educational discourse over the last hundred years, looking at teacher training manuals and uh, curricula and different pedagogical tools. And in reviewing these, uh, the languages and symbols that were used, they came up with four moments in formal education. Um, four kind of stages that the education has been passing through. And I, on the next slide, it presents a review of these four moments from the book. And I invite you now just to pause the video and have a little exploration of this uh, table. And you can have a, a bit of a sense of uh, what they're talking about in this book. Okay, so I'd like to focus on the fourth moment, um, systemic sustainability, which relates to complexity sciences and ecological and systems theory. And Davis and his colleagues came up with some really interesting examples to explain what this moment kind of means and how we can see it in our education system. So, for example, they noticed that in the second edition of the Oxford English Dictionary in 1989, the longest entry was for the verb set, which had 430 meanings and over 60,000 words in that entry. Now, in the writing of the third edition, the leader, the, the leader of the longest entry is currently run. And this definitional shift reflects societies moving from a setting the course to a running the course perspective. So from preparing children with, uh, and this will probably fit, Kind of toolkit to set them up for life from that to engaging them meaningfully and actively in a shared world and running things with them. And this reflects a greater sense of agency uh, for the participants in education. Another example that they give relates to the way that curriculum has been perceived and so this is our traditional kind of linear model of curriculum um, so this is just at learning progresses at an even rate as we go through the curriculum. This was then replaced by a notion of spiral curriculum, which kind of spirals around when we kind of learn things in this kind of circular, coming back to it each time, developing, deepening our knowledge each time we come around the spiral. And then this has been further uh, developed or augmented by this model of a kind of a a tree kind of model and and so here you can see how the different branches of our learning spread and grow organically as uh, we go through the education system so rather than us all of the people ending up at the end of the line as in the first model the linear model we see here everyone branches out and finds their own engagement with uh, the course that's being run and leading to an, a multiplicity of different outcomes for different participants in the system. So that was a brief look at um, Davis and colleagues' fourth moment. And now let's move on to complex systems. They talk a lot about complex systems. Here is an image of the connections between synapses in the brain, which is a complex system. This is an image of uh, the genetic interaction network 
of a yeast molecule, which is a complex system. This is a map of the interactions between females who like to cycle in urban areas in the New York and Philadelphia area, which is, as you've guessed it, a complex system. And finally, this is a musical score based on complexity theory. It's a complex way of writing music and allowing for musicians to interact with the score. And the point we're trying to hear make we're trying to make here is that complex systems can be found in very diverse fields of life, in the macro and the micro. Um, and what complexity scientists like to do is compare things that in some, in some ways look very disparate, very um, distant from each other, and yet find similar patterns of interaction uh, emerging from these complex systems. And this emergent quality of complex systems is something that's captured by this quote, which is attributed to Aristotle. So when we say that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, we're saying that something emerges which could not have been predicted if we'd looked at all of the individual parts. The interaction of the different parts generates something of a different quality. Another way of saying this is that the complex system is a living form. It grows and learns as it interacts with the world around it. And the nature of these interactions, the nature of the networks that emerge, is another thing that complexity scientists are interested in. So network theory would provide us with these three types of network. The centralised network with one main hub in the middle, communicating to all the nodes. The distributed network with a number of different equally important hubs. And the decentralised network where the main hubs are distributed throughout and they're constantly changing and communicating with the nodes in different ways. A more fluid kind of network. And we can see the image there is of a distributed network, which is, in this instance, the interaction between Bitcoin users across the globe. Now, if we were to consider network theory in relation to games and sports, as we, of course, are interested in at Counterplay, then we could consider that the centralised network relates to professional sports, where you have one main body who uh, publish the rules and the way the game is going to be played and those rules stay the same, and they're fixed, and any change comes from the main central body. And this allows people to have international tournaments and all know how, what rules are going to be played. And you might consider uh, amateur sports to be a distributed network, where you have lots of local or regional centres who are all communicating just with their region, and have their own slight version of the rules, or the way they're going to play the game, uh, and, the, and the etiquettes involved, um, based on their own regional factors. And then we might consider our own games community here at Counterplay as part of a decentralised network of games. Lots of different centres that keep changing, festivals, conferences, and p interactions of different sorts of people, academics, play theorists, performers, um, therapists, um, workshop leaders, facilitators, all coming together and sharing different ways of playing games and interacting with each other and the rules of the games aren't really fixed they're constantly changing and shifting as we learn new ways of playing and I think that's what's really lovely about this network is it's so fluid and open to change. And this leads me on to another area of theory which views games as complex adaptive systems and there's lots of really interesting articles which talk about this. Hopper describes games as a system of interacting and adapting subsystems. And so the human beings who are playing the game could be considered a, a living system. And within them, there are lots of other living systems, their psychology, their biology, um, their genetics, all interacting to create the behaviour 
from the human being. And then that human being's interacting with the other human beings who are playing the game, and also the social context of the game and the cultural context of the game. And all these different levels of systems are interacting with each other um, to keep the game alive. Richardson describes <coughs> this way of playing games uh, to place the game at the centre of the learning process and to decentralise the teacher and to allow, um, moving on to the next quote, to allow learning to be a non-linear and unpredictable process which is outside of the teacher's direct control but within their influence. So then the teacher's role changes from being controlling the game to um, influencing the parameters that allow the game to grow. And when we play games in this way, sometimes non-linear transitions in behaviour emerge, or new ways of playing the game, or new games. This has also been compared to the transition from ice to water to steam, and how suddenly something new emerges, a qualitative change, a new game emerges that we weren't expecting, we weren't planning to play. Many of us are familiar with the wonderful work of the late Bernie de Coven, and I've heard him introduce the game by saying, this is one way we could play the game. And that uh, really, acknowledge, really acknowledging that games are living, adaptable things, they're not fixed, they can grow and be influenced by the people who are playing the game and the environment in which they're in. And if we view games in this way, then perhaps our role as games facilitators is to gently coax the game towards that juicy place, that fertile place where the game can live and grow and change and interact with the environment. And some people have described that juicy place as the edge of chaos, which suggests some sort of optimal relationship between order and chaos. A tension between, on the one hand, an urge to retain control, to resist change and to maintain identity, and on the other hand, an urge to grow and explore possibilities for change. It's been suggested that learning operates at this edge of chaos. As new concepts are formed, thinking feels unstable and random, until it's organised and new distinctions are made, or new games are made, new rules emerge and ways of playing the game. Sheila Harry Augstein has referred to this as deep inner self-discovery, a type of self-organised learning which cannot be reduced to rules or robotic behaviour. So perhaps our role as games facilitators is to find this optimal balance between allowing for flexibility on the one hand and on the other hand limiting a pool of virtually limitless possibilities so that it's easier to be creative. So as we, as games facilitators, coax the game towards the edge of chaos, we are leaders of a dance between structure and openness between commonality and diversity, between design and emergence, between leadership and service, between directing and listening, between experience and learning. So that's the first part of this presentation. Thanks for listening and this, in the second part, I'll go through what we did in the session and how some of these ideas came to life.